Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. While out on a hunting trip, Carl Higdon encountered something beyond his wildest imagination. A humanoid figure with bizarre features and an otherworldly craft. As the figure approached him, Carl found himself whisked away on a journey to a distant planet aboard a transparent, cube-shaped craft. The encounter defied all explanation, leaving behind a trail of physical evidence and transforming Carl's life forever. From mysterious pills that sustained him for days to an otherworldly scan inside a megalithic tower, Carl's account is both fascinating and terrifying. As he struggled to comprehend what had happened to him, his experience baffled experts, sparked debates, and became one of the most bizarre UFO cases on record. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In a remote Mexican village, a young boy stumbles upon a gruesome ritual led by a self-proclaimed goddess, Magdalena Solis. As the cult's depravity spirals out of control, the authorities descend upon the village, uncovering a tale of human sacrifice, orgies, and drug-fueled madness. We'll delve into the mysterious history of the Holy Grail, from its ancient Celtic roots to its place in medieval Christian legend to its alleged current location. In the early morning hours of August 26, 1986, the lifeless body of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin was discovered in Central Park, sparking a media frenzy that would dub her murderer the Preppy Killer. Small mistakes can have big consequences, especially when they happen at critical moments in history. From an unlocked gate that led to the fall of Constantinople to a forgotten login that halted background checks for gun permits, we'll look at a few brain farts that changed the course of history in ways no one could have predicted. But first, in October 1974, Carl Higdon ventured into Wyoming's wilderness for a routine elk hunt, only to encounter something beyond belief, a humanoid figure and an otherworldly craft. His shocking encounter, complete with mysterious pills, a transparent cube, and a journey to an alien planet, defies explanation and continues to baffle experts to this day. We begin with that story. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In October 1974, with another harsh Wyoming winter on the way and food prices rising higher than most Americans could afford, 41-year-old Carl Higdon prepared to venture out into the woodlands and wilderness to hunt for a large chunk of his family's meat supply for the following few months. He had done so several times before, but with ample space still in the freezer, which had to feed himself, his wife, and four children, he ventured out again. On this particular hunting mission, however, things would take a bizarre and otherworldly turn. Higdon's account is one of the most fascinating on record and offers some physical evidence of, at the very least, a strange incident occurring. Furthermore, it is another case that offers details found in seemingly unconnected encounters across distance and time. Indeed, if there is any truth at all in the account of Carl Higdon, and all indications are that the incident is genuine, then it might offer us some clues as to why the UFO phenomenon exists and why it is so persistent. As the 25th of October began, Carl Higdon was not actually planning to go hunting. 
at least not initially. He was preparing to go to work as normal when he received a phone call from one of his crew members before his afternoon shift. The crew member was sick and wouldn't be able to come in. Higdon, reasoning that he wouldn't be able to get anything done without his sick crew member, decided to take the day off as well. With the afternoon free, he decided to venture out into the Wyoming countryside to hunt elk. He set out to Carbon County and to McCarthy Canyon with his truck packed up for the afternoon. However, along the way, he encountered some fellow hunters who appeared to have trouble with their vehicle. He pulled over to assist the pair and consequently began talking with them. They informed him of a place deep in the Medicine Bow National Forest where there were many more elk and where the hunting was much better. It was a remote, little-known spot, but due to his kindness, the stranded hunters were happy to divulge the information to Higdon. Following his assistance in getting their vehicle started, he set off again. However, this time he changed his destination. He would now head to the Medicine Bow National Forest instead. He wasn't too far out, he reasoned. He was around 40 miles from his hometown of Rawlings. By the time he arrived at his destination, it was late afternoon, just short of 4 p.m. There was still light, but it was about to go into decline. Upon exiting his truck and preparing his hunting gear, Higdon spotted another fellow hunter, his friend Gary Eaton. The pair spoke for a few minutes before Gary informed him he was going higher into the forest than Higdon, but that he might scare down some elk for him. As his friend went on his way, Higdon made his way to the location the stranded hunters had informed him about. As he did, he came across a concealed area behind a hill. It was shortly after entering this area that a sudden burst of movement out of the corner of his eye caught his attention. He focused on his surroundings and spotted a small herd of elk. He was slightly above the elk, five of them in total. With his hunting rifle raised, he took aim at one of the animals and fired. However, not only did the kickback from the gun not happen, there was no sound whatsoever. At the same time, Higdon had the end of the rifle at his sights and claimed to have witnessed the bullet leave the barrel and travel through the air so slowly it floated like a butterfly. It eventually dropped to the ground about 50 feet in front of him. He suddenly became aware of a painful silence all around him. Not a sound came from anywhere or anything. Higdon could sense a feeling of static electricity that you often get before a fierce thunderstorm. Coming to his senses a little, he stepped forward to retrieve the fallen 7mm bullet. He noticed that the lead part was no longer in the bullet, which itself, or the casing of it, was misshapen considerably. Suddenly a twig snapped somewhere nearby. Higdon would spin around, immediately seeing the figure in front of him. Thinking it was a fellow hunter, he lowered his gun quickly. As the strange figure emerged from the shadows of the trees, however, he realized something was terribly wrong. The figure was most definitely humanoid and male, but it wasn't human. Higdon would later recall that the figure had no detectable ears, with very small eyes and no eyebrows. He also recalled that his hair was coarse, like straw growing out of his head. It had a slit-like mouth that exposed three extremely large human-like teeth. Perhaps most bizarre were the antenna-like objects on each side of its forehead. Higdon would add, no chin was visible. His face just seemed to blend right into his throat. He had no jawbone. He would estimate the mystery male creature to be around six feet in height and adorned in a one-piece, tight-fitting black suit, similar to a wetsuit scuba divers wear. On the chest were harnesses that crisscrossed each other. The figure also wore a metallic belt with a six-pointed yellow star where the buckle should have been. Already unnerved and bordering on panic, when Higdon noticed the creature's right arm, it was all he could do to prevent absolute terror from gripping him. Where the hand should have been was a drill-like device attached or blended onto the wrist. He looked at the left arm, noticing there was nothing at all on the end of the blunt limb. The creature moved forward, directly approaching Higdon. Bracing himself for the worst, it was a disorienting surprise when the creature asked matter-of-factly, how are you doing? Already struggling to keep his composure and process what was happening, when the strange creature asked Higdon if he was hungry, it simply threw him even more. Before he could answer the question, a clear package levitated towards him, seemingly at the commands of the strange visitor. 
Higdon reached for it. He opened the cellophane-like package, revealing four pills inside. The creature told Higdon that one of them would last him four days, and he should take one now. Without questioning, Higdon reached for one of the pills, placed it in his mouth, and swallowed it. He then placed the package into his pocket. The creature said his name was Oso One. As he moved, Higdon became aware of a transparent, cube-shaped object on the ground behind the figure. He would estimate it to be around five feet high and wide and around seven feet tall. Although he was not told so, Higdon somehow realized this was the strange figure's ship. As if reading his mind, the creature asked him, do you want to come along? Although he didn't specifically answer yes, he must have gestured as much. The next thing he knew, he was inside the cube. Next to him was also one struggling to understand how they could both fit inside such a small object, Higdon looked around in awe, but still with a persistent panic bubbling away inside of him. When he noticed the five elk were also in the cube with them, his own memories and senses began to become fuzzy. He would recall, though, that they were motionless, paralyzed. It was then he realized he was sat in a chair with bands holding his arms down firmly. He could feel that the craft was lifting off the ground. He also noticed another of the creatures enter the room. It approached him, fitting a bizarre, helmet-like object to his head. The underside of the craft was clear, and beneath him, Higdon could see a planet-shaped object similar to a basketball. It was a planet, but it wasn't Earth or any other planet he knew of. They would enter this mysterious world, and although Higdon's memories of it are hazy at best, what he does recall is fascinating. Most prominent in his mind was a megalithic tower that dwarfed all around it. He would recall that all around this tower were revolving patterns of multicolored lights. The lights were so intense that Higdon couldn't keep his eyes open to look at them. Apparently unaffected by their guest's discomfort, the figures brought the craft to land at the base of the tower. Higdon could see the alien world through the transparent walls of the craft. He was amazed then that in front of him, outside the craft, were several humans talking to each other just as they would on Earth. He claimed there were two young girls, one around 11 years old and one in her early teens, a teen couple around 18 years of age, and an older man in his 50s. As he watched the scene outside the ship, his host approached him once more. They were, he claimed, on a planet 163,000 light miles from Earth. Higdon questioned if the creature had meant light years, to which he replied, the passage of time is different for them. Also, one then motioned that they should go, and Higdon was led inside the behemothic tower. He was taken into an elevator, which took them to a room with a platform in the center of it. He was told to stand on the platform. As he moved, he noticed he was not walking, but floating, although he didn't understand how. Upon stepping onto the raised platform, a glassy shield appeared from out of the wall. It stopped in front of Higdon, evidently performing some kind of scan on him. After five minutes or so, the shield retracted away from him and back into the wall. Then, his host informed him rather bluntly that he was to be taken back to Earth where they had found him, as he didn't suit their purpose. What is extremely interesting about this detail is just short of a decade later, an elderly gentleman in England named Alfred Burtu would receive almost the exact same response to a similar examination on a landed UFO. It is highly unlikely that Burtu was aware of Higdon's encounter, and perhaps endorses what Higdon believes. The purpose was a breeding program. Because he knew it, he was back inside the cube with no real memory of how he had arrived there. He did recall, however, of also one admiring his primitive weapon before handing him back his rifle. He also, rather bizarrely perhaps, remembers his host informing him that their home planet had no fish in their seas, which was one of the things about Earth that their people most liked. As they prepared to take off, the creature took back the pills as Higdon would now no longer need them. This was his last memory of the cosmic encounter before he found himself back on Earth. Disoriented and on the verge of mentally breaking down, 
Higdon didn't question how his truck had seemingly been moved several miles from where he had parked it to the spot where he encountered the humanoid creature. When the creature stated to him, we'll see you, he realized he was floating slightly above the ground. The next thing he knew, the craft was gone, and he was standing on the edge of a rocky cliff edge. Although the drop was only 10 feet or so, he was not prepared for it. When he landed on the ground below, he would sustain considerable injuries. Perhaps he also suffered a concussion in the fall, as his next memory is of struggling along a dirt road, unable to remember what had happened or where he was. He eventually relocated his vehicle, although due to his shredded memory, he didn't realize it was his truck. He was simply using it to take shelter. When a voice came over the CB radio, he quickly picked up the receiver and asked for help. Unsure of his location, he would recall a sign that stated he was at the North Boundary National Forest. A search party would eventually locate him just before midnight. When they did, they were at a loss as to how he had managed to drive the truck there. Furthermore, there were no tire tracks anywhere nearby, despite the muddy ground. And just to add another twist to the whole encounter, as the search party was looking for Higdon, they would encounter strange green, red, and white flashing lights in the skies overhead. Higdon's wife had joined the search effort. However, Higdon at first failed to recognize her. When he finally did respond to the search party, he exclaimed wildly, they took my elk. Higdon would eventually go with his wife to a patrol car and was taken to the nearest hospital. The rest of the search unit, with great difficulty, eventually managed to remove his truck from its mysterious location. As well as the injuries sustained in the fall, doctors would notice how bloodshot his eyes were. Further tests would reveal more intriguing results, though. His blood, for example, appeared to be enriched with nutrients and vitamins, more so than the average person. Even stranger, scarring on his lungs from exposure to tuberculosis had seemingly disappeared. In short, as Dr. Tongo who examined him would state, he is now in A1 super condition. It is hard to imagine that this transformation isn't connected to the encounter. It was the following day when Higdon began to remember the encounter in full. With his consent, the authorities informed the press of the incident. This, in turn, would attract members of the UFO community, researchers and enthusiasts to seek out Higdon to hear of the mind-bending events. One of those who took an interest in Higdon's case was Leo Sprinkle, who was adept at using hypnotic regression to unlock memories of such encounters. Although much of what occurred was already known to Higdon, the sessions in early November 1974 did manage to reveal some other interesting aspects of the incident, and quite possibly offers us an insight into why such visitations are happening. According to Higdon, the visitations to Earth are essentially food-gathering missions. Many of the animals and fish on Earth do not exist anywhere else in the universe. Groups of such animals, such as the elk on this occasion, go to their home world for breeding purposes. He also stated again that humans who go to this alien world are there for similar reasons. However, no further information came to mind regarding the particulars or details of the program. Higdon did state, however, that he believed the reason he did not suit their purpose was due to him having had a vasectomy several years previously. Incidentally, Sprinkle would find in his evaluation that Higdon is reporting sincerely the events he experienced. Aside from the bizarrely crumpled bullet that he retained, it is impossible to explain the vanishing of the lung scars that are on his medical record. And then there's the impossible location of his truck that the search party never could explain how it came to such an inaccessible spot. Several years later, in 1978, Higdon underwent a polygraph test. He passed it unquestionably, with the report stating something utterly fantastic did happen in this man's life. The test proves it beyond doubt. Carl Higdon's encounter remains one of the most intriguing UFO cases on record. It offers details and physical evidence that suggests something truly extraordinary happened that October day in 1974. Whether it was a genuine extraterrestrial encounter or a complex psychological event remains a topic of debate. However, the consistency of Higdon's account, 
the physical transformations he experienced, and the corroborative elements from other UFO cases lend significant weight to the credibility of his story. As we continue to explore the mysteries of the universe, Higdon's experience serves as a compelling reminder of the unknown possibilities that may exist just beyond our understanding. Up next, in the early morning hours of August 26, 1986, the lifeless body of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin was discovered in Central Park, sparking a media frenzy that would dub her murderer the Preppy Killer. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. In the early morning hours of August 26, 1986, a cyclist biking through Manhattan's Central Park near 5th Avenue and 83rd Street encountered a shocking scene. A woman's lifeless body laid near a tree, covered in scratches and other marks. The woman was later identified as 18-year-old Jennifer Levin, who had been seen leaving a bar with a man just hours earlier. That man was 19-year-old Robert Chambers Jr., who the press later dubbed the Central Park Strangler and the Preppy Killer. The story of Levin's death and Chambers' background as a prep school attendee became a media sensation, and while Chambers claimed Levin's death was an accident, evidence proved Levin fought for her life. On August 26, 1986, Robert Chambers and Jennifer Levin, who had casually dated over the summer, left Dorian's Red Hand Bar on Manhattan's Upper East Side together at approximately 4 a.m. According to Chambers, he and Levin went to Central Park to make love and she used her underwear to bind his hands behind his back. However, Chambers claimed he became upset after she repeatedly squeezed his groin area. In response to the pain, Chambers, who was 6 foot 5 and weighed 220 pounds, claimed he reacted by hitting Levin in the throat with his arm, knocking her off him. Levin, who was 5 foot 4 and half Chambers' weight, immediately fell backward onto the ground. Chambers said he knew something was wrong after Levin fell but he left the scene without attempting to revive her and never called 911 to get the young woman medical attention. After killing Levin, Chambers didn't flee the scene. Instead, he sat on a wall near the crime scene until a passing cyclist came upon the 18-year-old's lifeless body around 6.15 a.m. and called 911. When law enforcement and emergency services arrived at the park, Chambers was still in the area but didn't tell any of the officers he knew Levin. Consequently, police told Chambers, along with other members of the public, to vacate the scene. When detectives examined Levin's body, they found she was partially clothed and covered in bruises and cuts. 
They also noticed marks on her neck, and the medical examiner later determined she had been strangled to death, not killed by a single blow to the throat, as Chambers later told authorities. After police told Chambers to leave the park, he returned to the Manhattan apartment he shared with his parents and fell asleep. After learning Levin's identity and discovering she had been at Dorian's red hand shortly before she died, police questioned the patrons who were at the bar that night. Investigators soon learned the victim had left with Chambers and went to his home to question him about his possible involvement in Levin's death. When officers arrived at Chambers' apartment, they noticed the 19-year-old had scratches on his neck and face and proceeded to bring him in for questioning. When investigators asked Chambers how he got the deep scratches on his body, he told them that his cat, who detectives later learned was declawed, had caused the injuries. Eventually, Chambers confessed to killing Levin, but denied strangling her, instead telling officers her death was a case of rough sex gone wrong. After providing law enforcement with a videotaped confession, Chambers was reportedly surprised when they placed him under arrest. As he was being booked, Chambers reportedly said to his father, why didn't she leave me alone? In coverage of the case, the press referred to Levin's journal as her sex diary because according to Chambers' defense attorney, it included details of kinky and aggressive sexual activity by Jennifer Levin with many lovers. One article even argued Levin, who was strangled by a man twice her size, was to blame for her own murder in a piece titled How Jennifer Courted Death. Soon after Chambers' arrest for Levin's murder, the press dubbed him the preppy murderer and the preppy killer because he'd attended private preparatory schools, including York Prep, Choate, and Browning. While he'd gone to private schools and lived on Manhattan's Upper East Side, Chambers' parents weren't particularly wealthy. In fact, his mother worked as a nurse and his father was a videotape distributor, and Chambers attended these expensive prep schools with the aid of scholarships. In contrast, Levin lived in Manhattan with her father, who was a successful real estate agent and her stepmother. She attended the Baldwin School, an elite private school for girls. Levin was also planning to go to college, while Chambers was kicked out of Boston University after just one semester. While Chambers wasn't wealthy, his mother wanted him to network with the elite, so when he was young, she arranged a play date between him and John F. Kennedy Jr. Purportedly, Chambers' mother cared for JFK Jr. as a nurse when he was sick with bronchitis. During that time, she suggested the young patient and her son go to a restaurant and theater. According to the woman, who was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis's assistant at the time, Chambers' mother repeatedly got upset with her then five-year-old son for saying the wrong thing. While Chambers' mother sent her son to private schools to help him make connections with wealthy and influential people, Chambers reportedly took advantage of these relationships by routinely stealing from his friends. In fact, just months before he strangled Jennifer Levin in Central Park, he stole his friend's credit card. He racked up thousands of dollars in fraudulent charges, but Chambers' mother convinced the victim not to press charges. Larceny apparently wasn't a one-time incident with Chambers either. After killing Levin, he was convicted of committing several burglaries, having stolen approximately $70,000 from penthouses on the Upper East Side. Some sources allege Chambers committed burglary, petty theft, and credit card fraud to support his cocaine habit. After his arrest in 1986, Chambers was released on bond for the following two years. His trial began on January 4, 1988, and lasted approximately three months. The jury deliberated for nine days, but they were unable to reach a unanimous verdict. In the end, Chambers accepted a plea bargain that required him to plead guilty to first-degree manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Shortly after Chambers went to jail, a videotape taken shortly after he was charged with murder in 1986 was leaked to the press. The recording featured Chambers with several young women in lingerie. At one point in the tape, Chambers strangled a doll and said to the camera, oops, I think I killed it. After Levin's sister, Danielle Levin Roberts, viewed the videotape, in which it appeared as though Chambers was mocking Jennifer's death, she told the media, he's not even a person, he's an animal. In 1988, Levin's parents filed a wrongful death suit against Chambers, seeking $25 million in damages. Chambers pleaded no contest to the charges and was ordered to pay lump sum payments to the Levins, as well as 10% of his wages until the amount was paid in full. In a note, Chambers wrote to the court, he said, 
I elect not to contest the action for damages brought against me by the Levins. My only wish is for the nightmare to end, for both families and friends. I do not wish the Levins to endure any more pain." Chambers spent a total of 15 years in prison, 1,592 days of which were in solitary confinement for committing nearly 30 serious offenses while behind bars. Chambers tested positive for drugs multiple times, and prison officials found heroin and marijuana on his person and in his cell. Chambers also struggled to complete college courses and drug rehab treatment, and he regularly fought with prison guards and other inmates. In 1988, just months after Chambers was sent to prison for killing Levin, he was given 90 days in solitary confinement when a corrections officer discovered a modified straight razor in his locker. Chambers' first request for parole was denied, in part because Levin's mother told the board, in my eyes, anything less than the maximum would devalue my daughter's life. The board members denied his release in 1992 because they believed Chambers would most likely break the law again if he was paroled. While Chambers seemed somewhat contrite in a note he wrote to the court in 1988 about the wrongful death suit the Levins filed against him, he didn't seem to express any remorse at his 1994 parole hearing. According to the hearing's transcript, Chambers told the board, I guess I could also give you the party line and say I've learned my lesson, I will never do this again, but that's not how I feel at this moment because I have a lot of conflicting emotions. Shortly after Chambers was charged with Levin's murder, he began dating Sean Cuvell, a young woman who lived in Manhattan and even appeared in the video in which Chambers strangled a doll. After Chambers pleaded guilty to killing Levin, Cavell remained loyal to him, paying him weekly visits until he was released in 2003 after serving 15 years in prison. Following Chambers' release, he and Cavell lived in Georgia for several months before they moved into a Manhattan apartment. Over the course of approximately three years, Chambers was arrested multiple times for drug charges. In 2007, he and Cavell were charged with selling cocaine and heroin out of their home on East 57th Street. Cavell pleaded guilty to criminal sale and was given probation while Chambers received a much harsher sentence. While Chambers' girlfriend Covell pleaded guilty and was granted probation after she agreed to enter a drug treatment program, Chambers initially pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to the criminal sale of a controlled substance. He also admitted to using as many as 12 bags of heroin a day. According to Chambers, he became addicted to drugs when he was just 14, so his judgment and brain had been damaged by more than two decades of narcotics abuse. Chambers eventually pleaded guilty after reaching an agreement with the prosecution. On September 2, 2008, Chambers was sentenced to 19 years and four months behind bars for drug charges, as opposed to 15 years for strangling Levin. Reportedly, his longtime girlfriend Covell ended their relationship sometime after his 2008 conviction. Chambers was incarcerated at Wend Correctional Facility in Alden, New York, but eventually was paroled in 2023 at the age of 56 having spent more than half his life in prison. When Weird Darkness returns, in a remote Mexican village, a young boy stumbles upon a gruesome ritual led by a self-proclaimed goddess, Magdalena Solis, as the cult's depravity spirals out of control, the authorities descend upon the village, uncovering a tale of human sacrifice, orgies, and drug-fueled madness. But first, we'll delve into the mysterious history of the Holy Grail, from its ancient Celtic roots to its place in medieval Christian legend to its alleged current location. That story is up next. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black-eyed kids 
submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black-eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend, another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night? Listen to the book and find out. The Black-Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In Arthurian legend, knights scoured the English countryside in search of the Holy Grail, a precious object that once touched the lips of Jesus Christ and allegedly bestowed eternal youth on its owner. But what exactly is the Holy Grail? Is it real? And if so, where can it be found? These questions have fascinated historians, scholars, and writers for years. The Holy Grail appears in legends of King Arthur, medieval poetry, the best-selling books of Dan Brown, the Indiana Jones franchise, and of course the British comedy film Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Most recently, the relic appears in the 2023 Netflix docuseries Mysteries of the Faith. The true history of the Holy Grail is as curious as its supposed location, becoming much more than a simple chalice over the last 2,000 years. Today, the Holy Grail is considered an important Christian relic, which, according to some legends, can grant eternal youth and happiness. But the Bible only makes passing reference to cups that might be the Grail. As Christianity.com explains, there is no specific biblical verse describing the Holy Grail or its powers. However, there are certain lines in Scripture that could potentially reference the object. In Luke 22, verse 20, which describes the Last Supper, Jesus takes a cup and tells his disciples, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. There's also mention of how Jesus has offered bitter wine while on the cross in Mark 15, 23. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. However, there is no direct reference to the Holy Grail there either. So how did the Holy Grail come to be regarded as a powerful Christian relic? The idea of a Holy Grail may originate from pagan Celtic and ancient Roman traditions, but it was incorporated into Christian legend during the Middle Ages. History.com reports that Cretan de Troyes' unfinished Conte de Grail, Story of the Grail, or Percival, first presented the Grail as a divine object in 1180. Two decades later, Robert de Boron linked the Holy Grail, the Last Supper, and Jesus Christ's crucifixion in his poem Joseph de Arimathea. These works and others folded the Holy Grail into the King Arthur legend. They described how knights like Percival and Sir Galahad sought the divine object, which is depicted as a vessel with miraculous powers. From this point, the Holy Grail and the quest to find it became a cornerstone of Western literature. It also elevated the object from a biblical aside to an important Christian relic. Fictional stories place the Holy Grail in various locations. In Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the Grail is found in the Canyon of the Crescent Moon in Petra, Jordan. In The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, the Holy Grail is not an object at all but a reference to the womb of Mary Magdalene. Other myths place the Holy Grail elsewhere. Certain Arthurian legends claim that Joseph of Arimathea brought the object to Glastonbury, England and buried it there. Believers of this legend claim that this is why waters in the area run red, because they are moving through Christ's blood, though scientists say it's just because of red iron oxide in the ground. Theories about where the Holy Grail can be found vary widely. Some believe it's lost in the sewers of Jerusalem, while others believe it's hidden in the Americas. The Holy Grail has also been quote-unquote found in the ancient city of Antioch, in Toledo, Ohio, and in 200 other places across Europe. In 2014, a book called Kings of the Grail suggested that a goblet held at the Basilica of San Isidoro in Leon, Spain could be the divine object. Its authors claim to have found evidence in ancient Egyptian manuscripts that the Holy Grail was taken from Jerusalem to Cairo, where it fell into the hands of an emir who ruled in Spain. 
the emir allegedly gave the chalice to King Ferdinand, and then it found its way into the basilica in the 11th century. Dating of the chalice suggests it was made between 200 BC and 100 AD. This, along with historical documentation, suggests that the chalice could be a cup used at the Last Supper, though it's impossible to determine if Jesus drank from it. However, the Basilica of San Isidoro isn't the only Spanish church that claims to house the Holy Grail. The Valencia Cathedral in Valencia also professes to have it. Like the Basilica in Leon, they say they have evidence to prove it. I always say the evidence is like twigs from a tree, Jose Verdeguer, Valencia Cathedral's historical artistic heritage curator, explained in an interview with the BBC. If you have only one stick, it breaks easily, but if you join 50 together, you can no longer break them. Here there are many arguments together, and it is no longer easy to break them. The Valencia Cathedral claims that the Holy Grail was taken by St. Mark, a disciple of St. Peter, from Jerusalem to Rome. In Rome, it was used by early popes, including St. Peter, whom Roman Catholic tradition defines as the very first pope, to conduct the Eucharist. Of course, with dueling claims, it's difficult to determine which Holy Grail is the actual Holy Grail, but that assumes that this sacred object exists at all. So is the Holy Grail real? It depends on who you ask. Though the Holy Grail is regarded today as an important Christian relic, many Christians will be the first to tell you that the elusive chalice isn't that important in terms of understanding the Bible or worshiping Jesus Christ. As Christians, we know eternal life only comes from the Lord, not from relics, Christianity.com writes. If we spend our lives questing after supposed relics with supernatural powers, we miss the point of true Christianity and our purpose here on earth to spread the gospel. Healing comes from God alone, not from objects Jesus or some saint supposedly touched." Unquote. This source puts little weight on the importance of the Holy Grail and derides the idea that it's some kind of magical object that could bestow powers on its owner. But other religious sources argue that the chalice is important because it was supposedly touched by Jesus Christ. The legend of the Holy Grail is more complex than just a cup. Its passing mention in the Bible has been embellished over the centuries, from a chalice used at the Last Supper, to a powerful object sought by Arthurian knights, to a real-life goblet claimed by churches around the globe. The hundreds of alleged grails that exist, the cup's murky history, and even murkier biblical existence make it difficult to know if the Holy Grail is real. In that way, maybe Monty Python and the Holy Grail got it right in its depiction of the search for the chalice as a fruitless quest. The Grail legend is a literary invention of the 12th century with no historical basis, Carlos de Ayala, a medieval historian based in Madrid, said, according to History.com. You cannot search for something that does not exist. On May 31, 1963, state police officers and a contingent from the Mexican Army entered the Sierra Madre Mountains near the small villa of Yerba Buena. They were searching for two people who had recently gone missing. One was a young boy from the village, but the other was a respected police inspector who had gone into the rugged region to look into claims that something sinister was occurring in the mountains near the village. The police officers and the soldiers would eventually find the two missing people along with something so terrible that the stories about it are still whispered about in Yerba Buena today. The story began in late May 1963, when 14-year-old Sebastian Guerrero was hiking in the mountains near the village. The area around the eastern foothills of the Sierra Madre was home to many old legends, including caves filled with lost treasure, abandoned mines, and hidden gold. It was nearly dark, and Sebastian was almost ready to return home when he saw flickering lights inside a nearby cave. He walked inside to investigate and heard sounds coming from inside the cave. The sounds were human, whispers, groaning, and eerie moans. He smelled something burning. It was some sort of incense, probably copal, a resin first used by the Aztecs and then adopted by modern-day brujas or witches. Sebastian crept deeper into the cave, staying silent and out of sight. He peered over some rocks and received the shock of his life. Inside a large cavern, 
many of the people of Yerba Buena had gathered. He saw faces he recognized, but they were all naked. Many of them were having sex, others were passing around a cup, drinking a dark liquid from it. On the far side of the cavern was an elaborate altar. It was then that Sebastian realized what the dark liquid in the cup was. Human blood. The body of a man was on the altar, hacked to pieces. Cups were used to collect his blood. Standing over him was a woman. She was holding the bleeding heart of the man who had been butchered. Terrified, the young man ran more than 15 miles to the town of Villagran, which had the closest police station to the isolated village. There he breathlessly tried to explain what he saw. But the officers only laughed at him, thinking his imagination had run wild. But Sebastian insisted he was telling the truth. He repeated his story, demanding that they listen to him. Something terrible was happening in the caves near Yerba Buena. Finally, a police inspector named Luis Martinez agreed to take a look. If Sebastian would show him where he had seen the ritual and the murdered man, Martinez would return there with him. Neither of them was ever seen alive again. Until just a short time before Sebastian's discovery of the cave, Yerba Buena had been a very quiet place. It could barely be called a village since it was really an ajito or communal farm. Only about 20 families lived there. There was no school, no law, not even a church. The poor semi-literate residents were farmers selling what little of their produce they could spare in nearby towns. Then in 1962, two brothers, Santos and Caetano Hernandez, came to Yerba Buena. They were small-time criminals who had drifted through northwestern Mexico, stealing and cheating people before leaving various towns before they could be caught. Why they came to Yerba Buena, an isolated community with no money and no resources to speak of, is a mystery. When the Hernandez brothers arrived, they claimed to be prophets of the ancient Incan gods. Using tricks and stage magic, they convinced the community members they had supernatural powers. They concocted stranger rituals to bolster their claims, lowering their inhibitions using cannabis-laced incense and frightening them with animal sacrifices. They told the villagers that if they followed their directions, they would be led to great wealth which was hidden in the nearby caves. Since the people of Yerba Buena had no money for them to take, the brothers demanded other kinds of tribute from their new followers. They were worshipped and lived like kings, choosing women from the village, some as young as 14, to have relations with and to serve as their slaves. And it wasn't just girls they were having sex with. They took whom they wanted, when they wanted, and soon turned the rituals into orgies. The people didn't hesitate to do what they asked. The brothers had, of course, been sent by the gods. However, as months passed and there was no gold, some of the villagers began to question the alleged powers of the Hernandez brothers. To keep things going, the brothers announced a plan to go into the high mountains and speak to their gods. When they returned, they promised they would bring a goddess back with them. Instead of going to pray in the mountains, they traveled to Monterey to find a sex worker who would return to Yerba Buena with them and pretend to be a goddess. And that was how they met Magdalena Solis a young woman who had been forced into sex work at the age of 12. As she had grown older and more street smart, she began a lucrative side hustle pretending to be a spirit medium and fortune teller, claiming to channel the spirits of long-dead brujas. When the Hernandez brothers described what they were doing in Yerba Buena, she eagerly agreed to return with them and brought along her brother, who was also her pimp, Eleazar. The Hernandez brothers walked into the village that day without her. They told the residents that the goddess would soon arrive, but a ritual was needed to summon her. As they all gathered that night, a thick cloud of black smoke appeared, and when it cleared, Magdalena was standing among them. The villagers were stunned. Magdalena soon found herself in complete control of the people of the village. She had all the cannabis and peyote that she wanted, and she lost herself in a drug-fueled haze. Under the influence of narcotics, she came to believe that she really was a goddess, specifically the reincarnation of the Aztec mother goddess Coatlicue. With Magdalene now in charge, the rituals became darker and more twisted. Villagers were given peyote, which made them highly susceptible to her commands. She insisted that they perform animal sacrifices and drink the blood of their victims to gain immortality. The orgies escalated, becoming horrific, frenzied events directed by Magdalena. There was rape, 
incest, and bestiality. Those who refused to go along were called unbelievers, and the villagers were ordered to beat and kill them. As her bloodlust spiraled out of control, she demanded human sacrifices. Unbelievers and those not obedient enough were beaten, burned, and hacked to pieces by their fellow villagers. But Magdalena didn't just butcher her victims. She copied the ancient Aztec ceremonies in which hearts were cut from the bodies of human sacrifices while they were still alive. It was one of these gruesome rituals that Sebastian Guerrero had stumbled upon that evening in late May 1963. When Sebastian and Inspector Martinez didn't return from the mountains, local officers turned to the state police for help. Accompanied by soldiers, the group went to Yerba Buena to look for the missing men and to see what was happening in the sleepy little village. Magdalena and her brother, along with Santos Hernandez, were found in a farmhouse at the edge of town. All of them were nearly comatose from the drugs they had ingested that day. Magdalena and Eleazar were arrested, but Santos tried to flee. He was shot to death in a field. Seeing the large group of armed men descending on the village, the residents ran, trying to hide in the caves. Gunfire was exchanged, but the residents were outgunned. Those that survived the shooting were taken into custody. During the search that followed, the bodies of Sebastian and Inspector Martinez were discovered. Their hearts had been cut out of their bodies. A search of the nearby caves yielded the bodies of six more victims, many of whom had been dismembered. Cayetano Hernandez was also found dead, but police would later learn he had been murdered by another villager, Jesus Rubio. Magdalena and Eleazar, as well as the villagers arrested in the raid, stood trial in Ciudad Victoria. Since none of the people from Yerba Buena would testify against them, Magdalena and Eleazar were only convicted of the murders of Guerrero and Martinez. They were sentenced to spend the next 50 years in prison. The villagers were convicted of group or gang murder or lynching for the other six victims and given 30-year sentences. Though only the remains of eight people were discovered, it was suspected that the cult may have killed many more. What happened to Magdalena Solis, whom the newspapers dubbed the High Priestess of Blood, is unknown. Some stories say she died in prison, while others say she was released. Could she be walking the streets today? It's very possible. Even if she had served her entire sentence, without parole, she would have been released in 2013. She had only been 16 years old when she was convicted of her crimes. That means she would be in her mid-70s now? That's something you may not want to think about when you're trying to get to sleep tonight. Up next, small mistakes can have big consequences, especially when they happen at critical moments in history. From an unlocked gate that led to the fall of Constantinople, to a forgotten login that halted background checks for gun permits, we'll look at a few brain farts that changed the course of history in ways no one could have predicted. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. 
you can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Everybody experiences brain farts from time to time, but usually the fallout is something minor, like forgetting to pick up 2% milk. However, when important people make small mistakes, the consequences can be catastrophic. History's biggest brain farts have sometimes left a lasting stain on the world. In 1453, the long-standing Byzantine Empire fell as their capital city, Constantinople, was overrun by the extremely tiny mistake of somebody forgetting to lock the door. The powerful wall defending the city wasn't enough to stop the invading Turks once they realized they could just walk in through a gate-sized hole in the defense without any real resistance. As such, Constantinople fell, and one of the greatest empires in history ended with it. During the Cold War, America did almost anything it could to halt the spread of communism. When Fidel Castro led a revolution to take over Cuba and subsequently began working with the Soviets, the CIA decided to fund a counter-revolution known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. The initial plan was to have a two-pronged assault on Castro's forces, with an air attack from multiple units and a ground attack hitting simultaneously. If done effectively, Castro's men wouldn't be able to mobilize in time for a counterattack. However, the Pentagon forgot one tiny problem. Time zones. Failing to take the time difference into account, the bombers hit an hour before the planes that were supposed to cover them arrived, leading to their destruction. This failure made it difficult for the ground forces to do their job, and the whole attack quickly turned into a disaster. Over 1,100 troops were captured by Cuba and held as prisoners of war. It took years for all of them to be freed. The 27th Amendment states that Congress cannot raise or lower their salaries mid-term. The idea was to protect against corruption by limiting Congress's control over their salary. However, when the amendment was proposed in 1789, it didn't get enough votes to fully ratify it. Weirdly, Congress failed to add a sunset clause to the amendment, which meant it could still be voted on and ratified. It hung around for another 200 years before anyone decided to do anything about it. The only reason it was ever ratified in the first place was because a college student believed it was possible and, after getting a bad grade on a paper arguing for its ratification, decided to campaign to get the amendment finally ratified. All because nobody thought to take the amendment off the docket after a certain amount of time. In the 1970s, Xerox was a world leader in computer technology. The only problem? They didn't bother releasing any of that technology to the world. Before Mac computers were released to the general public, computers were nothing but lines of text and code. There was no such thing as a mouse and no real way to navigate the computer except by typing in commands. The Xerox Alto changed all that. It was the first machine recognizable as a modern personal computer. It utilized a graphical user interface, or GUI, to make the computer easier to use, and it was invented in 1973. The first Macintosh didn't go on sale until 1984. Instead of realizing the amazing technology they'd invented, Xerox opened up their factory for anybody to tour and look at. Steve Jobs showed up and immediately saw the potential of computers with a GUI. He took the technology Xerox was freely showing him, with no restrictions, and added it to his personal computers. For a brief moment in time, the King James Bible encouraged readers to go ahead and commit adultery. In fact, it commanded it. It's unclear where the problem originated, but in 1631, over 1,000 copies of the Bible were printed without the word not in the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, thus reading, thou shalt commit adultery. As such, the Bible was deemed the wicked Bible, and King Charles I demanded all copies be destroyed and the printers lost their license to print. It seems unlikely that any families were torn apart by suddenly encouraged adultery, 
but those Bibles are worth several thousands of dollars today. The best businesses are built around accountability. Everybody in the company answers to somebody so that no one person can go rogue and take the company down through incompetence or even malicious intent. So maybe it comes as no surprise that a management flaw allowing investment trader Nick Leeson to be in charge of double-checking his own work resulted in the bankruptcy of Britain's oldest bank, Barings Bank. Because nobody could check his work, Leeson made several poor investments in the mid-1990s that he easily hid from his co-workers. By the time anybody knew what was going on, Leeson had gambled away over $1 billion. In 1995, the company was forced to declare bankruptcy after 200 years in business. And generally speaking, when somebody wants to acquire a gun or a concealed carry permit, they'll need to go through a few rounds of background checks. Ideally, this process roots out those who suffer from serious mental illness or have had serious, felonious brushes with the law in the past. But it's pretty hard to run an internet-based background check when the person in charge of running those checks forgets their login credentials, and even more so if they don't tell anybody about that for over a year. That's exactly what happened in Florida. In June 2018, it was revealed that the state of Florida conducted zero background checks on people who applied for concealed weapons permits between February 2016 and March 2017, because one employee simply couldn't remember how to log in. This means anyone applying for a concealed weapons permit during those 13 months was approved, and it occurred during one of the largest gun sales spikes in state history. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. John 3 verses 20 and 21. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives in the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And a final thought. When you judge and criticize others, you don't define them, you define yourself. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.